The Nicene Creed is the ultimate statement of Christian orthodoxy. Millions of Christians worldwide recite it every single week. Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Anglicans, Evangelicals. I'm not going to recite the whole thing for you, you can look that up for yourself. But among other things, it affirms the doctrine of the Trinity, the belief that God is three persons in one being, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it also affirms the general outline of Jesus' life as described in the Gospels, that he was born of a virgin, that he was crucified, and that he was raised again from the dead. But even though this creed is so familiar to so many Christians today, it actually reflects the theological anxieties of a bunch of bishops living back in the 4th century. Nearly every single line is aimed against other Christians who believe differently about the nature of God and the nature of Jesus. So how did the Nicene Creed form, and who was it aimed against? The Nicene Creed was first accepted at the Council of Nicaea in modern-day Turkey around 325 CE. This was a time of theological controversy among certain pockets of the Christian intelligentsia. The church historian Socrates Scholasticus writes that a dispute arose between two Alexandrian clergymen, the Bishop Alexander and an elder named Arius. Alexander was trying to explain the nature of the Trinity, how God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit could somehow be unified as one. And Arius tries to start some logical argument. Well, we say that Jesus is the Son of God, which means he was begotten from God, which means Jesus must have had a beginning. It logically follows then that Jesus is not eternal, which means he is a separate and lesser being than God himself. You can imagine why this was controversial to early bishops. So according to some church historians, Arius' ideas go viral. Bunches of people all over the Mediterranean start following Arian theology. But it's important to remember that a lot of people held ideas like Arius. The notion that Arius was the first one to suggest that Jesus was somehow a finite and lesser being is just a product of anti-Arian writers. And most of our histories about this time come from anti-Arian authors like Eusebius, Sozomen, and Socrates Scholasticus. Emperor Constantine Constantine got involved in the dispute, and in order to address the disunity he was seeing, he invited the bishops to his residence in Nicaea, where an anti-Arian majority hashed out a theological statement to condemn Arius, the first iteration of what would become the Nicene Creed. A later council in 381 CE would embellish this statement to something a little more familiar to us today. The anti-Arianism in the Nicene Creed is most obvious in the second section when it talks about Jesus. Check out how hard it drives home the idea that Jesus is definitely not a separate lesson being to God. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Okay, yeah, we get the idea. Jesus is definitely the same thing as God. All right. The crux of this section is the line of one being with the Father. Of one being is actually a single Greek word, homoousios, meaning the same substance or existence or being. So this is sometimes called the homoousion controversy because the whole dispute arose about the nature of Jesus to God. Are they the same substance? Are they separate substances? Now, many people look back at the Council of Nicaea as the archetypal example of Christian unity. Remember back in my Orthodoxy versus Heresy video, people often view ancient Christianity as the big institutional church fighting off splinter cells of heretics. So viewed from this perspective, the Council of Nicaea is seen as the triumph of orthodoxy over rogue heresy. But if we view early Christianity as an exploding supernova of different Christian groups and competing theologies, this council is actually a lot more interesting. It's not a council defending orthodoxy because orthodoxy didn't exist yet. In the words of church historian R.P.C. Hansen, this council was a search for orthodoxy, a search conducted by the method of trial and error, and a search that really didn't solidify for another few centuries. Christians didn't regularly recite the Nicene Creed in the liturgy until the 6th century, 200 years after the Council of Nicaea. So we shouldn't view this council as a battle between orthodoxy and Arianism. This is a polemical dichotomy invented by authors in the 4th and 5th centuries. But let's view this council from a varieties of early Christianity perspective, and see this council for what it was, a confederation of a few hundred bishops, mostly from the Eastern Mediterranean, who decided that their position of orthodoxy is the true orthodoxy, in a vast ocean of differing and competing theologies. And what they were attacking wasn't some monolithic entity either. There was no Arian church. 
there was no group of people that self-described as Arian. Arius was just another guy that held one theological idea that was shared by many other people. The Germanic people such as the Goths and Vandals were thought to believe some form of Arianism as well. The Emperor Valens probably held Arian theological ideas too. So all this to say, early Christianity was impossibly diverse. Therefore, we shouldn't view the Council of Nicaea as legally binding for everyone, or universally accepted as authoritative. Remember, the vast majority of early Christians simply didn't care whether Jesus was made by or begotten of God the Father. It was a rarefied community of literate elites that cared about these theological controversies. And even among them, there was a lot of theological difference between them. Only in retrospect do we see that the Council of Nicaea was a significant first step on the path to define orthodoxy. And the original controversies that sparked this council are still fossilized in every line of the creed today. As always, thanks for watching and subscribing, and I'll see you next time. So last episode, we discussed Marcionism, which actually generated some pretty great discussion. So one subscriber, Offret9719, asks, did Gnostic Christianity develop from Marcion's beliefs? They both believe in two gods. So first of all, Gnosticism is a broad umbrella category. We can't say that there was one type of Gnostic theology where they believed in two gods like Marcion. Rather, there was a huge diversity within what we would call Gnosticism. And whether Marcion was influenced by Gnostic theology is actually really controversial among scholars. Some say no, not at all, and others say yeah, significantly. And some Gnostic ideas sound pretty familiar to us when we compare it to Marcion. Like the idea that there's a otherworldly god that has nothing to do with the world, and that the material world is corrupt and somehow evil. This is pretty Gnostic sounding stuff that Marcion seemed to have believed in. But if you read through the Nag Hammadi library, which scholars generally see as the biggest corpus of Gnostic writings available to us, you'll start to notice a lot of ideas that Marcion just never seems to talk about. That there are bunches of celestial beings between humanity and God, and the idea that there's a divine spark of gnosis within each and every person. These ideas are just foreign to Marcion, so we can't really say that Marcion was Gnostic. Part of the difficulty is a lot of what we know about Gnosticism is pretty late, like the 4th and 5th centuries, while Marcion is really early, the early 2nd century. We just don't know that much about Gnosticism before the 2nd century to really make an accurate theory about how the two are interrelated. But this does go to show how much there can be overlap between what we consider different theologies. So if you have any questions about the current video, please feel free to leave comments and I'll try my best to answer your questions in the next video. Thanks so much for watching.